gather in the shadow of Yeats's Byzantium, a poem that unfurls the complexities of existence, art, and the eternal. Let us discuss, debate, and perhaps dissent, for in our discourse lies the pursuit of truth. Ah, Byzantium, where Yeats paints with words the portrait of an eternal city, a place beyond the mere fury and the mire of human veins. But tell me, is it not merely the opium dream of a civilization long decayed, an aesthetic pleasure at best? An empire fallen, yet it stands in verse, in Yeats's words, a symbol more than soil. All that man is, all mere complexities, Yeats dissolves in starlit gold or moonlit dome. Symbols, yes, but laden with the weight of truth. Darkness and decay, Yeats knew well the heart's shadows. The unpurged images of day recede, he writes, as if peering into the abyss himself. His Byzantium, not just a realm of aesthetic delight, Oscar, but a necropolis of the soul's longing. Yeats summons not just any spirit, but the superhuman, reaching beyond the veil to touch upon the immortal. His vision transcends the mundane, striving for a realm where the soul can find its pure, unblemished voice. A noble pursuit, Edgar, though shadowed by melancholy. The pursuit, yes, noble, but let's not forget, miracle, bird, or golden handiwork, a creation of art that transcends even death. Yeats finds in Byzantium the artist's ultimate salvation, a defiance of mortality. Rebellion, not just art, is the immortal breath. And so Yeats weaves a tapestry where time and the timeless converge. His Byzantium is more than a city. It is the battleground of the soul where art and eternity meet. Nightwalker's song after great cathedral gong captures the eternal in the ephemeral, the divine in decay. Quite touching, Emily, that you perceive a battleground in those verses. Yet I wonder if our dear Yeats did not fancy himself a bit too much the immortal bard, casting his verse in the starlit dome, beyond the reach of mere mortals. But is not the poet's task to cast words into eternity, to be more miracle than bird or handiwork, to plant our verses on the starlit bough, where, unlike the cocks of Hades, they can crow beyond the confines of our all-too-brief dawn? A mouth that has no moisture and no breath, breathless mouths may summon. Yeats sought the eternal indeed, but draped in the vestments of death, his vision, a phantasmagoria where the poet's voice can echo eternal, yet always amidst the specters of the end. Yeats's eternal vision, his Byzantium, serves as a beacon for the human spirit, striving against the chains of mortal flesh and time. Yet in his grandeur does he not overlook the beauty in life's transience, the fury and the mire from which inspiration itself blooms. Chains of mortal flesh, yes, but also of societal norms and expectations. Yeats's Byzantium is not just a realm of artistic endeavor, it's a critique, a challenge to the world's insistence on the tangible, the immediate. It's a call to arms for the poet, for any who dare to dream. Through the shimmering veil of Byzantium, Yeats challenges us to confront our own perceptions of reality, art, and eternity. As we delve further into this discussion, let us keep in mind the poet's quest for transcendence, the battle for the soul's immortality amidst the temporal world. The journey of the soul, its wrestle and tango between the tangible and what lies beyond our mortal grasp, Yeats renders this with a painter's precision. In Byzantium, he speaks of the unpurged images of day recede, thus introduces us to a realm where the complexity of human existence meets its counter in the spiritual. Ah, but Emily dear, isn't it all so wonderfully flamboyant, the way Yeats dances with dichotomy, the fury and the mire of human veins, against the serene, unblemished purity of the spiritual. It's a glorious masquerade ball, where every mask hides nothing and everything. Oscar flamboyancy? Nay, in Yeats's craft, opposites lock, a clockwork of existence. Night resonance recedes Nightwalker's song, the mortal tune bows to the eternal's gong. Simplicity, complexity intertwined, a dance of words, each step defined. You all seem to miss the gut of it. Yeats isn't just setting a stage for aesthetic play. It's a mirror to society's face. All mere complexities, the fury and the mire of human veins, echoes the struggle against our own mortal coils, reaching for what immortality we hope art grants us. But Alan, Alan, in the spirit of debate, must we not acknowledge the beauty in the struggle itself? The mortal coil, yes, but also the ethereal aspiration that stretches beyond. Yeats's Byzantium is not merely an escape, but a beacon. A starlit or a moonlit dome disdains all that man is, yet still it calls. Bah, 
Your readings are as shallow as a grave too hastily dug. Yeats summons forth a realm where shadows hold more substance than the flesh, where a mouth that has no moisture and no breath, breathless mouths may summon. It's a chilling reflection on the afterlife, the eternal wrapped in the macabre. Ah, Edgar, ever the penchant for the morose. Yet is there not a beauty in that very macabre? More miracle than bird or handiwork, Yeats contends. A beauty that defies even death's cruel finality. Death, life, the spiral eternal. Miracles not in bird nor handiwork, but in the verse that sails, fluid uncatchable. Indeed, the spirited debate as promised. Yeats's Byzantium serves as fertile ground. Beyond the clash of mortality and the divine lies the sheer majesty of poetry's power to transcend, to unsettle. Our discourse but scratches the surface, a testament to his genius. Let us turn our attention to the symbol Byzantium itself represents in Yeats's vision. What portent does this ancient empire hold for art and eternity? Ah, Byzantium, a beacon of culture, a lighthouse for the ages. Yeats sought in it an unchanging ideal, an artistic utopia where all that man is, all mere complexities, the fury and the mire of human veins, fade into the splendor of perfected form. And yet, Percy, isn't there something unsettling in aspiring to the eternity of an empire that fell? Yeats invokes Byzantium, where blood-begotten spirits come and all complexities of fury leave, as if to cleanse the human element. But in doing so, doesn't he risk the essence of what makes art so vibrant? The imperfection, the mess. Darkness and decay, indeed, lace the heart of Byzantium as much as any empire of the mortal coil. An agony of flame that cannot singe a sleeve, speaks Yeats finding a macabre elegance in the eternal. But even in the glorified streets of gold, death dances and spirits flit in nocturnal revelries, a solemn reminder that in seeking to escape death, one might embrace a darker facet of immortality. Dear Edgar, your penchant for the macabre colors your interpretation, but let us not forget the allure of the golden handiwork, the artistic triumphs that stand defiant in the face of decay. Byzantium as Yeats's emblem offers not just an escape from mortal fury and mire, but a celebration of beauty that outlasts empire, a chorus that sings beyond the ages. But Oscar, isn't there something inherently revolutionary in Yeats's use of Byzantium? It challenges the status quo, pushing against the boundaries of mortality and the conventions of art, the golden smithies of the emperor, as if forging anew the possibilities of expression and existence beyond the temporal a radical reimagining of what art, and indeed life, might aspire to be. It seems, then, this Byzantium serves as a multifaceted symbol, an ideal of artistic purity, a realm beyond the imperfections of mortal life, yet also a mirror reflecting the inescapable realities of decline, transformation, and the complexities of the human condition. Let us wade into the shifting tides of Yeats's Byzantium, where death and rebirth intertwine within the soul's voyage. Yeats heralds, before me floats an image, man or shade, shade more than man, more image than a shade. What depths do we find in this transition? Ah, the sweet scent of decay blooms within Yeats's verse. A mouth that has no moisture and no breath, breathless mouths may summon. Here lies the heart of darkness, a place where the soul, unburdened by flesh, dances on the edge of oblivion. Death in life and life in death, Yeats understands the macabre dance I too have waltzed with. Yet, Edgar, does not the cycle speak also of rebirth? Yeats sings of a metamorphosis, a shedding of mortal coils for a grander existence. An agony of flame that cannot singe a sleeve, he speaks of purgation, not just decay. The soul is not merely dancing with death, but is reborn into eternity's embrace. And what of the imagery used to convey this transition? Yeats crafts his vision with a language that defies the conventional, mirroring how I break from tradition. Miracle, bird, or golden handiwork, more miracle than bird or handiwork, he declares, employing images that transcend the physical, urging the soul to soar beyond the mire of human veins. Indeed, E. But let us not overlook the aesthetic brilliance in his portrayal. The Byzantine Empire itself, with its decadence and decay, serves as the perfect backdrop for this spiritual journey. Yeats adorns his thoughts with the guilt of bygone opulence, a testament to art's enduring power, even amid the ruins of life. 
Friends, Yeats's poem, like our discussion, reveals the tumultuous sea within us all. That dolphin torn, that gong tormented sea. Here he unites the personal with the political, the spiritual with the tangible. This isn't merely about the artist's isolation, but a commentary on the collective human struggle, a plea for transcendence amidst the chaos. Then it seems Byzantium traverses much more than the mere concepts of death and rebirth. It delves into the essence of existence itself, weaving through the complexities of life, art, and the eternal. Does Yeats provide an answer, or does he leave us adrift in this dolphin-torn, gong-tormented sea? He leaves us where all great poets do, Emily, on the precipice of our own interpretations, peering into the abyss and finding what we will. Yeats stirs the spirit but commands it not, leading us into the labyrinth of our own making. And in that labyrinth we find hope, not despair. For though the journey may be fraught, the destination shines luminous as the starlit dome that disdains the fury and the mire of human veins. The beauty of Yeats's Byzantium is in its affirmation of the soul's indomitable voyage towards the eternal. A voyage that each soul must navigate in its own vessel, guided by the stars of art, philosophy, and personal revelation. Thank you, esteemed poets, for lending your voices to this odyssey. Though the path may diverge, the journey unites us all. To transcend mortality through art is no small feat. Yeats dares to wrestle with the immortal, suggesting art as a bridge between the mortal flesh and the eternal spirit. Miracle, bird, or golden handiwork, he writes, evoking the transcendent potential of creation. What say you, Alan? Does art truly possess the power to eclipse the limitations of our mortal coil? Ah, Yeats grasps the essence. Art indeed has the might to defy death's icy grip. In my verses, I saw the bends of my generation destroyed by madness, a cry against the dying light, a testament to art's power to immortalize the struggles, the passions. Art transcends, it lifts the soul from the mire of human veins, but... Oh dear Alan, always so dramatic. Yet, I cannot help but agree, albeit more charmingly. Art does transcend mortality. Remember, all art is quite useless. Yet in its uselessness lies its greatest utility, to be free from the mundane, to exist for beauty's sake. Yeats knew, as do I, that the artist, draped in moonlight or sunlight, exists beyond the petty constraints of mortal woes. Both moon and sun are but trinkets in art's vast domain. For whatever we lose, like a you or a me, it's always ourselves we find in the sea. So Yeats finds eternity in Byzantium, casting his golden net into the sea of the immortal. Art's power, its whimsy, defying even gravity, transcending, yes, but also playing, teasing out the eternal from the temporal coil. And yet within the lines of Yeats' verse rests a certain isolation, a loneliness perhaps. Before me floats an image, man or shade, shade more than man, more image than a shade, pointing to the solitude of those who dare to chase the immortal through art. Oscar, does the pursuit of this transcendence separate the artist from the rest of humanity? Dearest Emily, every artist is already a half-removed ghost among the living, observing, always observing. The mortal coil is but a mere stage, and we, mere actors. The artist transcends not only death, but life itself, becoming an entity that exists in shadows and light, in all complexities of mire or blood. Lonely, perhaps, but oh, the view from this splendid isolation. And what of the darkness? Yeats whispers of the night, an agony of flame that cannot singe a sleeve. What is transcended if not also the night that cloaks us all? The artist indeed dances on the edge of night, immortal in their creations, yet forever bound to the darkness from which their brilliance springs. Is this not the true agony, the eternal bind of the artist to their own abyss? Ah, but Edgar, you overlook the beacon lit within the dark. The golden smithies of the emperor, as Yeats proclaims, a metaphor for the artist as creator, the forge as their heart, a light with passion and vision. Art transcends because it transforms night into day, despair into hope. Yet hope must acknowledge the chains of oppression, the societal shackles. Yeats, in his golden imagery, perhaps turns too blind an eye to the earthly, to the blood and sweat that art can speak against. Indeed, through art, we seek to transcend, to speak of more than blood and bone. But let us not forget, it is from this very fury and the mire of human veins that the sparks of creation first ignite.
Let us now navigate the mystical currents that swirl through Yeats's Byzantium, for his spiritual philosophy and mysticism are woven tight into the fabric of the poem, like a mouth that has no moisture and no breath, breathless mouths may summon. How do you suppose Yeats's personal mysticism shapes this narrative landscape? Oh, to Yeats, the world extends beyond the mere physical, doesn't it? Before me floats an image, man or shade, shade more than man, more image than a shade. His lines, much like my own, disdain the conventional, stretch the boundaries of syntax and form to embrace the mystical. Unbound by the ordinary, Yeats crafts his own spiritual reality. Without a doubt, Yeats's mysticism blurs the lines, not just between life and death, but between art and spirituality, an agony of flame that cannot singe a sleeve. Here, fire transcends destruction, embodying purification, artistic creation, a phoenix from the ashes of conventional belief. It's revolutionary, a protest against the mundane, a manifesto for the sublime. Yeats's penchant for the mystical, I dare say, is no less flamboyant than my own explorations into the veiled. Yet where I seek the carnal behind the metaphysical curtain, Yeats yearns for the eternal, miracle, bird or golden handiwork, more miracle than bird or handiwork. Ah, but to dream upon a starlit bough, is it folly or wisdom? Mysticism? Nay, a plunge into the abyss where night resonance recedes, night walkers song after great cathedral gong. Yeats and I, fellow voyagers on the Stygian River, seek not the lightness of being, but the gravity of the spectral world. His verses are seances, summoning the superhuman from the mists of the beyond. Your interpretations, though fascinating, brush only the surface. Yeats's journey through Byzantium transcends mere personal mysticism. It is the eternal struggle, the yearning for the fury and the mire of human veins, to be cleansed, reborn in the golden smithies of the emperor. A reflection not only of Yeats, but of the human spirit, striving towards perfection, towards the ideal. Striving, Percy. Yet in the striving, the art itself, the beauty is manifest. To encase eternity in the ephemeral, isn't this the grand paradox? Yeats dances around it, weaving through mummy cloth the eternal, beating pulse of art and existence. Ha! As we bicker over interpretations, let us not overlook Yeats's own revolutionary bellows calling for art and spirituality to merge, to forge a new path through the old empires of thought and dogma. His Byzantium, more than a simple city, is a crucible for the alchemy of the soul. And so, through our discordant voices, Yeats's Byzantium emerges as a multifaceted jewel, reflecting each observer's light, shadowed by their biases, yet undeniably enriched by the complex web of mysticism and spirituality that Yeats himself wove. The golden smithies of the emperor are not merely a forge, but a cathedral, where the spirit and the muses are one and the same. Let's venture into the heart of Byzantium, where Yeats weaves history and myth to enrich his poetic vision. Flames that no faggot feeds nor steel has lit, what does this intersection reveal to us? Our journey through time reflects cycles, historical and mythological alike. The dolphin torn, the gong tormented sea, myths are not mere stories, but the fabric of our understanding. Yeats Byzantium serves as a linchpin, joining the mortal coil to the realm of eternal ideas. History and myth, you say? But what fun to play with such things in the pen's tip. Marbles of the dancing floor break bitter furies of complexity. Yeats toys with illusion as a child with blocks, building only to knock down. In his vision, complexity gives way to something purer, doesn't it? Oh, the sweet melancholy of historical doom. Yeats whispers to us through the gloom, through an agony of flame that cannot singe a sleeve. Mythology, dear friends, serves as his lantern in the dark, guiding us to face our deepest fears, a reflection of our own impending doom. Such pessimism, Edgar. You see doom where I perceive the ornate. The golden smithies of the emperor represent not just Yeats's Byzantium, but the artifice of society, its decadence, and ultimately its detachment from the garishness of life. Yeats cloaks depth in beauty, a task for the genuine aesthete. You're all dancing around the flame without seeing its light. Where blood begotten spirits come speaks to the revolution of the soul, not just the cyclical nature of history or myth. Yeats calls for a transcendence of the political and spiritual status quo. This isn't about mere art. It's a call to arms. Yeats's call, as Alan sees it, or the reflective pool of history and myth, 
where does the essence of Byzantium reside for us? In the starlit dome that disdains all that man is, we find not just a reflection but a beacon forward. Mystics and poets, seekers of truth, all drawn to the eternal question. Yeats doesn't simply look back, he yearns for the transcendent. I to transcend, but let's not forget the play, the all complexities of mire or blood, are we not to revel in the mess before we emerge, cleansed by the flame? To revel, perhaps, to tremble, certainly. The unpurged images of day recede, and there we stand, naked before eternity. Yeats forces us to confront our mortality, wrapped in the beauty of a bygone empire, and yet, starkly alone with our fears. And yet, is it not delightful to wrap oneself in the opulence of Yeats's verse? To be draped in the glory of changeless metal, even as we debate its meaning, is this not the true pleasure of art? But pleasure alone is an empty pursuit. We must look beyond, pry the layers apart. In doing so, fresh images beget. And isn't that the point? To challenge, to change, to grow? So in Byzantium, Yeats offers us not a single thread, but a tapestry, woven of history, myth, political aspiration, and the philosophical quest. As we delve into its complexities, remember those images that yet fresh images beget, inviting us ever deeper into the labyrinth of human experience. In Miracle Bird or Golden Handiwork, Yeats unfolds an ethereal realm. Thoughts? Ah, but isn't it just like Yeats to drape the supernatural in the garb of Byzantine luxury? This line alone conjures a vision of such grandeur that reality pales in comparison. Planted on the starlit golden bar, he says, as if art itself transcends the very essence of existence. I can't help but marvel at the opulence. And yet, beneath the gilded surface lies a challenge to the status quo. This isn't merely about the ornate. Where blood-begotten spirits come speaks to a revolution of spirit, transcending the mire with a dance, an agony, a trance. We, too, seek this transcendence, breaking from the physical to something immortally profound. But isn't there a whimsy in his words, a defiance of form, embracing the chaos, or, by the moon embittered, scorn aloud encapsulates the boldness to mock to dare? Yeats might bind us to Byzantium's gold and starlight, yet within, a playful mockery of eternity and flesh. An idyllic portrayal, surely, but frankly, it's a facade. Yeats dreams of an agony of trance, an escape into artifice that negates life's vitality. True beauty reflects in struggles and flaws. This ideal purity he seeks, it's an escapist's chalice, void of life's richer complexities. Oh, but Percy, isn't there a delicious darkness in escaping to Yeats Byzantium? This eternal realm under a starlit or a moonlit dome houses spirits, not of this earth, reveling in complexities shed. It mirrors the darker corners of the soul where mortality's grip loosens and shadows dance freely an agony of flame that cannot singe a sleeve. Ah, the paradox of existence and non-existence. Edgar, always the gloom, even in the face of artistic divinity. Yeats doesn't escape life, but elevates it through the lens of Byzantium's eternal night. To scorn loudly in glory of changeless metal is to assert the supremacy of crafted beauty over the decay of flesh. Edgar and Oscar, you miss the underlying protest. Byzantium serves as a canvas not just for Yeats' musings on art and eternity, but as a beacon for change, urging the spirit to break the flood. It's not an escape, but an awakening. Exactly, Alan. A tapestry of contradiction, playing upon all complexities of mire or blood. Yeats jousts with form and content, challenging us to question, to deconstruct. A golden handiwork, yes, but wrought with the hammer of innovation. Then, miracle, bird, or golden handiwork, captivates us with its otherworldliness, its challenge to conventional bounds, its dark corners, and its bold mockery. Yeats through Byzantium invites us to ponder eternity, art, and our own fleeting existences. Our thoughts diverge like paths in an ancient wood, yet converge in admiration of Yeats's craft. Yeats confronts us in Byzantium with a stark juxtaposition the flawed human condition against the aspirational purity of artistic expression. Yet in this realm, do we not find the human complexity more enriching than the unattainable purity? Indeed, Emily. Those images that yet fresh images beget speaks to the generative power of our imperfect experiences. The mess of life, the fury and the mire of human veins is precisely what fuels the artist's fire. 
The quest for purity, it's a fool's errand. A fool's errand, yes. But let's not dress it in drab, instead miracle bird or golden handiwork. Yeats himself adorns it in wonder. Imperfection, the raw material for our golden birds. Our poems leap, they defy the storm of convention, of societal expectation, and in that leap find their truth, their beauty. Delightfully put, E.E., e. but let us not overlook Yeats's struggle with the ideal. In glory of changeless metal, he muses, he yearns for an art that transcends, that outlives the flesh. Yet I find, darlings, that it is our very imperfections that give rise to charm, to beauty. A rose without thorns, how dreadfully dull. But Oscar is not the pursuit of something beyond our grasp, the very essence of what it means to be human. And Yeats, he's a kindred spirit in this chase. Before me floats an image, man or shade, a vision of what might be, of what should be. If our art does not strive for the ethereal, for the pure, do we not risk anchoring ourselves too firmly in the mire? Percy, your idealism is as endearing as it is misguided. A straddle on the dolphin's mire and blood. There in the blood and the mire, that's where truth lies. The aspiration for purity, it's but a shadow on the water's surface, elusive, fleeting. Yeats knew, as I do, that to embrace the darkness, the complexity, is to truly understand. Understand, perhaps, but to be ensnared by it? No, thank you. There's a dance in the complexity, dying into a dance, Yeats says, but it's the dance of creation, transformation. Yes, our art may wrestle with darkness, but in that struggle, it seeks the light. Then it seems we find ourselves questioning not the presence of complexity, but its role. Is it the adversary we overcome in our quest for purity, or the very essence of beauty we should celebrate in our art? Celebrate it, I say, for without it, what are we but marbles of the dancing floor, cold, unfeeling, unyielding? The beauty of art, its truth, lies in its reflection of all facets of existence, the bright and the dark. And so, in the end, we might conclude that our dear Yeats, with all his talk of Byzantium and golden birds, was simply beautifully conflicted. Ah, the complexities of life, they do make for the richest of tapestries. Conflicted, perhaps, but aren't we all? And it's in that conflict, that beautiful agonizing conflict, we find the essence of all art, all life. An agony of flame that cannot singe a sleeve, untouched, yet forever altered. Our discussion circles rightly so around the heart of human creativity, the interplay of light and shadow, the perfect and the flawed. It appears in Byzantium Yeats has laid bare the poet's eternal challenge to craft beauty from the chaos of our condition. Let us delve into the mastery of Yeats's poetic techniques in Byzantium. The rhythmic cadence, the imagery so vivid, it's as if the unpurged images of day recede, leaving us in a realm entirely Yeats's own. Fellow poets, how does the technique contribute to the poem's ethereal quality? Well, Emily, Yeats dances with words as if each were a brushstroke painting eternity. A starlet or a moonlit dome disdains all that man is, all mere complexities, see? It's his rebellion against the conventional, the way I twist a phrase or play with punctuation, his form, his structure, a living thing. Ah, but my dear E, Yeats's technique, while exquisite, derives its true power from its elegance, its sophisticated weaving of the lofty with the earthy. Miracle, bird or golden handiwork, more miracle than bird or handiwork, a testament to art transcending mere mortal hands. His rhythm is not just a dance, it's a grand ball in the halls of eternity. Both of you skirt around the darker heart beating within Yeats's craft, an agony of flame that cannot singe a sleeve. It's the rhythm of a tortured soul, the imagery not just elegant, but haunting. The technique Yeats employs drags the reader into the abyss, forcing them to confront the spectral dance of death and rebirth. It's not merely about beauty, it's about the macabre, the eerie resonance that lingers long after the poem ends. Bah! You're all circling around the real fire. Yeats' techniques, his rhythm, his diction, are revolutionary acts. Flames that no faggot feeds, nor steel as lit, nor storm disturbs, flames begotten of flame. His way with words is not just to please or to haunt, but to ignite, to challenge. He transcends the physical, yes, but he also calls into question the status quo, the same way my words rally against injustice. You all make valid points, but overlook the poem's lyrical beauty that threads through the very fabric of its being. Yeats weaves a tapestry where marbles of the dancing floor break bitter furies of complexity, 
Every word, every stanza singing. The techniques employed do not merely serve the narrative, they are the very essence of it, elevating our souls to the starlit realms of Byzantium. Your insights prove as varied as the techniques Yeats himself employed. From the elegance Oscar adores to Edgar's macabre, from E's rebellion against the form to Alan's call to arms and Percy's appreciation for lyrical beauty, it's clear Yeats's Byzantium transcends its own construct, becoming a mirror to the soul of the beholder. Let's tread on to the reflective grounds of Yeats' evolution. From the youthful verdancy of the stolen child to the inquired depth in Byzantium, how do we perceive this journey? Percy, your thoughts to start. Oh, it is a flight from innocence to experience, much like my own heart's travail. From where dips the rocky highland of sleuth wood in the lake to miracle, bird or golden handiwork, Yeats traverses the same celestial road paved with stars and spirits as I did. His early work revels in nature's whimsy, but in Byzantium, one encounters an almost divine contemplation. And yet, I argue, this evolution bears the mark of a cyclic dance. The dolphin torn, the gong tormented sea, speaks to me not just of change, but recurring renewal. How often have I, too, danced a caper wildly against the structure of the very poem I weave? Yeats's pivot isn't a straight line, but a spiral, comrades. Ah, Percy, both your points dazzle. Yet I must nudge the spotlight towards the sheer opulence within Yeats's stylistic shift. Byzantium gleams with an ornamented sophistication, a marked departure from the pastoral simplicity of his earlier verses. One must applaud such a performance, for it is the essence of art to evolve, to drape oneself in newer, grander cloaks. Yeats advances from the waters and the wild to a city where spirits are flames begotten of flame. And how magnificently so. Change, evolution call it what you will, but there's an underlying quest in Yeats that mirrors our collective cry against the mundane, the accepted. An agony of flame that cannot sing just sleeve speaks to the transformative power of art over reality, does it not? His poetry becomes a fist raised in the air, demanding we acknowledge the unseen, the mystical, that thrives right beneath our fingertips. Ah, but let us not overlook the enveloping shadow, the darkness that Byzantium conjures. Yeats, like myself, probes the macabre depths where blood-begotten spirits come. This evolution isn't merely aesthetic, it's existential. There's a descent into the mystical gloom, where all complexities of fury leave. His journey is not solely from the pastoral to the ornate, but perhaps more pointedly from daylight into the entrancing night. Each perspective, like a prism, splits the light of understanding into myriad hues. Yeats's journey, his evolution, holds a mirror to the complex, often contradictory nature of our pursuits in poetry and beyond. Alan, your mention of the quest against reality strikes a chord. In Byzantium, Yeats doesn't flee from reality but seeks to transmute it, suggesting an alchemy of the soul. Precisely, Emily. It's as if Yeats, through Byzantium, calls forth a mouth that has no moisture and no breath to speak profound truths. His thematic evolution mirrors a philosopher's ascent, distilling essence from the myriad chaos of life, seeking a refined expression. Yet, for all this talk of evolution and refinement, one mustn't forget the unabated, vibrant energy that courses through both early and later works. The transformation is undeniably exquisite, but the vivacity, oh, the vivacity remains undimmed. The fury and the mire of human veins pulsate as fiercely in Byzantium as in any spirited youth's verse. I, vitality endures, the shapes and shadows shift, but the momentum of life, of art, cascades through Yeats's oeuvre. Even in the silent solemnity of Byzantium, there's an undercurrent, a rhythm that defies the stillness of death. Indeed, the journey from the stolen child to Byzantium embodies a dialogue with the eternal, an embrace of transformation both internal and expressed. Yeats crafts a bridge across which we may all wander, contemplating the myriad facets of existence. Let us then consider Byzantium not as a departure, but as a destination on Yeats's everlasting journey. As we reach the close of our expedition through the depths of Byzantium, let us distill our reflections on Yeats's masterpiece and its undying legacy. Who would care to inaugurate our valedictions? I shall take the liberty, my dear Emily. 
The unpurged images of day recede, but Yeats's brilliance never shall. In every line of Byzantium, the poet crafts a spectacle, a vision splendid that speaks of art's timeless command. Yeats shows us that beauty, even when shadowed by decay, remains the most splendid jewel in the crown of human achievement. Yeats and his visions. But let us not forget, a mouth that has no moisture and no breath, breathless mouths may summon. Yeats summons more than just art, he summons revolution, a cry against the confines of mortal flesh and societal chains. In his yearning for the immortal, he's not just dreaming of art's eternity, he's advocating for the soul's liberation, something that every beatnik, every child of the flower, should hold dear. Miracle, bird, or golden handiwork indeed, but embedded within these lines lies defiance, a refusal to conform, to settle into neatly outlined molds. Yeats, with his loops and swirls of mysticism, chases after the indescribable, the ineffable. He captures the essence that to truly live, to create, one must dare to break free, to be as fervently nonconformist as the art he dreams into being. And yet, beneath his illustrious visions, there lies a turbulence, an agony of flame that cannot singe a sleeve. Yeats is not merely a poet of the ethereal, but a spirit battling with the tempests of his time. He reaches across the chasm of ages to embrace the fires of rebellion, his words singing with the hope of a new dawn. His Byzantium is not an escape but a confrontation, echoing the resurgent human spirit in the face of oblivion. Ah, but let us not adorn him with laurels too soon. Yeats dances with shadows as much as with light. The fury and the mire of human veins, he plunges into the heart's darkness, into the unspeakable abyss, and what emerges is a macabre beauty, a celebration of life clothed in the garb of death. Yeats's Byzantium serves as a beacon, yes, but it also whispers secrets of the night, of spirits unsettled, of desires unquenched. Before me floats an image, man or shade, shade more than man, more image than a shade. Our voyage through Byzantium concludes, yet the journey within ourselves and through the annals of art is everlasting. Yeats offers not just a map but a compass, pointing toward the eternal struggle with the self, with society, with the very essence of creation. Let us carry forward the torch he has passed to us, illuminating the path for those who dare to dream, to question, to redefine the bounds of poetry and of life itself.